Welcome to Docs on Call, brought to you by Methodist Medical Center, with your host, Gina Morse. Good evening. On tonight's Docs on Call, we're clearing the air about lung disease. Our lungs expand and relax thousands of times a day to bring in oxygen and expel carbon dioxide. Lung disease can result from problems in any part of this complicated system. In fact, millions of people in the U.S. suffer from some form of lung disease. This evening, Dr. Ayub Patel and Dr. Ravi Kashyap from Methodist Medical Group Pulmonary Sleep and Intensivists are here to answer your questions. Just dial 698-3742. That's 698 698- three seven four two and let's meet our guests sitting closest to me is pulmonologist Ayub Patel and I know I'm mispronouncing that and I apologize we tried to practice that ahead of time you'll correct me here in a moment Dr. Patel specializes in critical care internal and pulmonary medicine and sleep disorders after completing medical school in India Dr. Patel came to Chicago for his residency and fellowship at John Strober Junior Hospital before joining the team at Methodist Medical Center he is board certified in all of the aforementioned specialties and we thank him for joining us this evening Thanks and to Thank you. To his left is Dr. Ravi Kashyap. After attending medical school in Mahat, at Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Medical College in India, Dr. Kashyap, among many achievements, completed a pulmonary and critical care fo- fellowship at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha. The former director of Methodist Medical Center's Sleep Center, Dr. Kashyap, is board certified in pulmonary critical care, sleep medicine, and internal medicine. And thank you for joining us. We're certainly happy to have you with us. And in fact, uh, people at home are already very interested. We have a a caller now who would like to ask you a question. As we mentioned, we uh, are talking about lung disease this evening and there are a wide variety of problems that can occur in this very complicated area of our body, not the least of which, of course, is lung cancer. We'll be getting to that in a moment. In the meantime, we want to see if we can go to that caller now and see what's on Hattie's mind. Thanks for watching Docs on Call. What's your question, Hattie? Uh, I want to know um, how you can get, uh, get, away, uh, get this uh, uh, emphysema away, you know, because I've been having it for a long time, and uh, sometimes I can't hardly breathe and stuff, you know, and I want to ask the doctor how you can get it, get, uh, get it away from me, you know. You want to be done with emphysema. Uh-huh. <laughs> And, and I bet the doctors are going to tell you maybe a few things you don't want to hear, uh-huh. but you're going to need to hear anyway. So doctors, okay. if you would, talk to Hattie and others at home about emphysema. Hi, Hattie. Uh, the emphysema is the disease that can happen either from active smoking or passive smoking. Either you actively smoke by yourself or if you're around the smoker a lot, it also can happen because of lot of inhalation of lot of dust and chemicals also but unfortunately usually the damage which is there is not something that usually goes away but there are a lot of medication that we can do to control the symptoms as well as the most important thing in emphysema is to stop smoking if somebody is still smoking and get away from the exposure of lot of harmful dust and chemicals if that person is still getting exposed to those are the medicines that are offered today for emphysema better than say a few years ago? Yes, we have more and more new medication coming out for treatment of emphysema, but unfortunately we don't have any that can completely just cure the emphysema. But we can have a lot of medication that can control the symptoms of emphysema. And we can talk to the patient about stopping the smoking, which will be the most important part of treatment. All right. Along with inhaler. And so let's assume that, that Hattie, if she ever smoked, is no longer smoking. What other things can she do to, to decrease her symptoms aside from the medication treatment that you mentioned? Minimizing the exposure to the passive smoking. Uh, not working in the area where there will be a lot of hazardous chemicals or fumes. And um, living better healthy life means if somebody is overweight, that can also contribute to a lot of symptoms than losing the weight getting into the exercise program that will strengthen your overall body stamina that will minimize your symptoms that can affect that can happen from emphysema very good 
Uh, I mentioned earlier we wanted to talk some about uh, lung cancer tonight. And in fact, Dr. Kashup, there is a, a new test that Methodist Medical Center will be offering, a diagnostic test for those who are concerned about uh, their risk for lung cancer. Perhaps they're a current or former smoker. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes, the, the uh, intent is to diagnose the cancer early. As we know in all the cancers, if you diagnose them early and treat them early, there's a potential, number one, to cure them, number two, to live longer. So this, what this program offers is to, uh, if you are a smoker and you want to be uh, screened for it, offers a CAT scan at a low cost. Uh, and if the CAT scan will be read by the radiologist, and if it is, it shows you have a spot in the lung which could or could not be cancer, then the further treatment uh, or diagno diagnosis can be administered at that point of time. And we're looking at some video now at, at the type of testing that a patient would go through. You mentioned the, the CAT scan. Again, this would be uh, starting up next month, March 1st, at the Methodist Cancer Institute uh, offering this lung check. And uh, it's important to note that the test does cost about $175. Um, most insurance companies not yet covering this test, but if it does detect a problem, insurance will pick up the cost from there most likely, correct? That's correct. Uh, once the, the CAT scan does show, for you know, unfortunately, if we have suspicion for lung cancer, from then on, that the diagnosis and the treatment will be covered by insurance. Good news indeed. And that early detection of lung cancer is so key because when it's caught in its latest stages, we know that the mortality rate is very high. So catching it early is that much more important. Absolutely. That's exciting. Let's go to Janice now, who's on the line. Thanks for your patience and watching Docs on Call. What's your question? Uh, yes. I was wondering if um, ground glass nodules in, uh, in your lungs could be histoplasmosis, and how would you find that out? And if they are, how would you treat it? Okay. okay. The, the ground glass opacity or ground glass nodularity that you are talking about could be one of many things. Uh, could it be histoplasmosis? Sure, it could be histoplasmosis but they are differential, including the cancer, including sarcoidosis, including just the pneumonia, uh, including uh, something we call idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, amongst the many, many, many causes. So just the CAT scan finding itself may, may not be diagnostic of histoplasmosis. How do we diagnose that? Number one is the history. Where do you live? Uh, what do you do in your life? Um, what are your symptoms? And then the, if there's a need for confirmed diagnosis, the only way you can confirm diagnosis is with the, uh, with the uh, uh, biopsy of that uh, nodularity. And let's back up for just a, a quick moment. Histoplasmosis, uh, for those of us who are like, hmm, what, what exactly is that? Uh, enlighten us, if you would, please. Histoplasma is, uh, you know, it's a fungus. It's around all of us. We all are get exposed, but if you are in the farming industry, live near by the farm, you might have a higher exposure. Now histoplasmosis is a disease where histoplasma, um, in, in, it's induced by histoplasma and there are nodules or the spots in the lung which can grow in size or may not grow. Uh, so that's why histoplasmosis is, uh, is a disease because of the fungus causing histoplasma. All right. Thanks for helping me, and I'm sure others understand that better. Let's go now to a question from Jerry. Thanks for watching, Docs on Call. What's on your mind? Hey, I'm just wondering, if living in the Peoria area, being a farm, a farm community, if all the, the uh, <clears throat> exhaust stuff from the manufacturing, and in the fall when the, the harvest the beans and the corn, the pesticides they use, if that causes a higher incidence of pulmonary and lung cancers than, say, any other place, Good question. I'm sure that people are concerned about yes. the environment. Yes. So, Jerry, it's a good question. So, obviously, if you are around the area where there is a lot of industrial dust, and if you are around the farming industries where there are a lot of lot of fertilizers are being used, a lot of chemicals being sprayed, uh, then there is little bit higher risk than the general population uh, of the lung cancer because you are being exposed to a lot of different chemicals which might be carcinogen. Not all of these are completely being tested for safety. 
so um, when when we get ex when we get exposed to a higher concentration on ongoing base for a long period of time yes the risk will go higher for the lung cancer development and does your practice see a higher than normal number of folks with these kinds of lung problems that you think may be connected with the environment we do have seen some lung cancer patient who haven't themselves smoked in the life but they were around the smoker a lot and they were working in the manufacturing industry so we do see sometime the lung cancer related to somebody who never smoked but still developed lung cancer okay. unfortunately let's go to a question now from Janice Janice thanks for watching Docs on Call what's going on with you well um, I was diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis and uh, I really have a problem with that the scarring was showing four years ago and of course this is a fatal disease and I can't understand why they didn't diagnose it then and I had gone to many doctors uh, thinking that it was another disease because I've never smoked I'm a nurse so free smoke there's <laughs> no smoking uh, but and I couldn't understand why I was having such short of breath on activity and now of course it's gotten worse it doesn't look real great and I'm wondering why somebody didn't say something and so I can at least change my life maybe. Had you had California. any previous history of, of lung issues or breathing issues before no, I this? No, ne I never, I never had none. And so uh, it, I, I was, I have, uh, I do have an autoimmune disease of lupus. Okay. Knowing that, then what would you say to her? Because obviously she's disappointed that it, her pulmonary fibrosis wasn't caught earlier. Jen, it's a good question. Uh, the pulmonary fibrosis by itself is not a disease. Uh, pulmonary fibrosis is the scarring of the lung. What you're referring to is something called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or uh, also known as UIP, or usual interstitial pneumonitis. That's a disease that happens for a known cause, and it is progressive, and it can be fatal over a period of time. Uh, that disease it's by itself, at this time, we do not have a confirmed treatment. There's some experimental treatment for that. So that's what the UIP or the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Now, scarring of the lung of pulmonary fibrosis in general could be, for example, in your lupus itself can induce the, uh, uh, idiopathic, the pulmonary fibrosis. A previous pneumonia can induce the pulmonary fibrosis. Um, a previous significant pneumonias can induce pulmonary fibrosis. So it's very important to get to the bottom of it that what is causing a pulmonary fibrosis. Not necessarily unusual to have to take your time with this diagnosis. It, 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 it has to go along with what the, um, once the doctor sees you and says, okay, this is, and compared to previous chest x they go with your history. As you said, you have lupus. Uh, now, that would be one of the differentials when we see a patient with a pulmonary fibrosis, is it something because of autoimmune disease? So you have to go through a gamut of tests to see, okay, this is where we are, and this is what is this because, now, uh, it is caused by. Now, going back to the fact of the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, the diagnosis is by open lung biopsy, or at least uh, something similar to that, we call VATS, but it's an invasive testing. Uh, so we do get to that at some point of time. After talking to you, that at this time, we don't have a treatment which is definitely working for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, there's some experimental treatment for it. All right. We're getting lots of callers, so I want to quickly move on to Julie's question. Thanks for your patience, Julie. What's on your mind? Hi. Um, I was just diagnosed with emphysema, and um, because I have had for the last three winters, I've been um, sent to the hospital emer for emergency. Uh, because I just couldn't get my breath. It's like everything just shut down really quick. Um, I have no history of smoking at all. I'm not around smokers, and I'm not around a lot of chemicals or anything, and I was shocked when they told me that it was emphysema. And they said, the doctor said that that somehow some something is causing my lung to just kind of shut down immediately, you know, just real quick. It doesn't work into it. It just kind of you know, swells up or whatever, and I wondered what, what could be causing that. Oh, what a scary diagnosis. Um, there are a lot of, we very few things that can cause emphysema without smoking or any chemical exposure. 
and one of them is called alpha-1 antitrypsin enzyme deficiency. This is one of the enzymes that you are needed to have in your lung to protect against certain damage. Now, usually it happens in the early age, and uh, it can be associated with sometimes some liver problem. And it's not co a common disease, but we may see rarely some an enzyme deficiency. Enzyme deficiency. It's called alpha-1 antitrypsin. Now, do you have that or not? Uh, for that, you might have to go, go one time blood test. It's a finger stick test, just like when somebody's checking your glucose. And uh, we can just check one time and make sure you're not having some something like that, like alpha and antitrypsin deficiency, and mm -hmm. then go from there. Or do you have, or you don't have emphysema, you might have something else. Uh, so, like, if the battery of the tests are done properly, like pulmonary function testing to evaluate the capacity of the lung as well as the CAT scan of the lung to see if you have something else causing trouble with the breathing. So it sounds like you think that Julie is still going to be in need of further testing yes. to get to the, the bottom of this problem. Yes. All right. Let's go to another caller. Linda is on the line now. What's your question? Yes. My mother had hippofrontosis, or how you pronounce this, because from baby chickens. They told her, and uh, is this hereditary? Hmm. Good question. What do you think? Uh, could you repeat that question? What was? Uh, she was. Her mother was diagnosed. I don't. I don't know if you were saying histoplasmosis. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, <laughs> that word that we were saying. Yes. Okay. Um, and the doctor said that it was caused or was connected somehow to baby chickens, and she's wondering if this could be hereditary. No, it is not hereditary. It has to be uh, the, the uh, histoplasmosis is caused by the exposure to histoplasma. So if you're not exposed to it, uh, it is not hereditary disease. And yet, we know many farming families, it is a family profession. And so uh, there's a chance that maybe she could have grown up with it. And if, if that were the case, if she was a child on the farm, could she be looking at potential lung problems uh, later in life, even if she's been off the farm for many years? Not necessarily. I mean, it depends. You know, people get exposed. Some people have developed histoplasmosis. Majority of them don't. So I want to make sure that people don't get concerned about being around the farm or around the chicken. Uh, majority, majority would not have any problem because of that. Good to know. All right. Thanks very much. It's time for us to take a quick break. When we return, our experts from Methodist Medical Group Pulmonary Sleep and Intensivists answer more of your questions about breathing easier and your lung health. You're watching Docs on Call. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Our topic tonight, lung diseases. Whether you're a current or former smoker, battle asthma, or other pulmonary problems, then tonight's Docs on Call is for you. Our experts from Methodist Medical Center are answering your questions when you call 698-3742. That's 698-3742. And we've got uh, some questions here from callers. Pat had this one about asthma. She's had asthma for years. She's wondering about Advair and uh, limiting it um, to safely take this medication, what would your suggestion be? The Advair is a combination of two medications. One is the steroid and another one is long-acting bronchodilator, which is just like albuterol, but it lasts longer in our body. Uh, so if somebody has severe asthma, then yes, they both need both of them. So sometimes we do use Advair for asthma. But the preferred approach is to just start with one of them, which is just steroid only. And if their symptoms are not under control, then, then step up and give maybe Advil, which is a combination of two medication. So, uh, depending on And if you're not taking Advil, you might be taking a steroid like a, an albuterol inhaler? Is albuterol is just a bronchodilator. Okay. There are some plain steroid inhaler also in the market like QR. Asmanex. So those are just only plain steroid without any long-acting bronchodilator because there are some studies that shows that when you use those long-acting bronchodilators, there are risk of sudden cardiac deaths. So we do not like to use except we really do have to use it. Okay, yeah. good to know. Laura wanted to know about interstitial pneumatosis. Pneumonitis? Pneumonitis. I think that is probably it. I was just having difficulty reading it. Yes, d tell me more about that. You know, the, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, non-specific diagnosis or term. Basically, so in you know, interstitium has pneumonitis, fibrosis, uh, inflammation. Um, basically, it, it leads back to our discussion earlier about the interstitial, usually interstitial pneumonitis or UIP. 
um, that I believe is her question. What the disease is about is a uh, idiopathic disease, meaning by for known cause, it happens at the uh, about sixth or seventh decade of life. Uh, it's a rapidly progressive disease. The uh, it onset is all of a sudden, no known exposure that has been clearly associated with it. The diagnosis is done with the open lung biopsy or video assisted bi uh, thoracoscopy and biopsy. And as I mentioned earlier, at this time we don't have any treatment uh, which has been approved for the treatment for it. There are some experimental treatment, something we use uh, um, in our regular practice and some of them may have to go to some specialized centers, research centers, for example, Cleveland Clinic and some other centers, they are looking at some research protocol for in usual interstitial pneumonitis. Okay. Rick had this question for us, and I'm particularly interested as someone who has had what I would term as seasonal bronchitis before. His first question is, is there such a thing as seasonal bronchitis? Uh, and he apparently is dealing with three months spring and summer and three months fall winter time. So uh, to me, that, that sounds like perhaps there's an allergy connection here too, but I'm not the physician. You guys are the experts. You tell me. Yeah. So actually, usually patient with the asthma, their attacks are usually when there are a lot of pollens. And in the spring and fall, we do see a lot of patients who are not diagnosed with the asthma coming with the bronchitis again and again. So there is a possibility that somebody can have asthma, which is not diagnosed yet, and they're just coming again and again with something they call seasonal bronchitis. It's just that each time in the spring and fall, the pollens will go high and then you will come down with the attack of asthma. So it's a good idea to be checked out if some, that person has asthma or not. Is there a risk of being treated for what you think is bronchitis when it is actually asthma? Do you treat it any differently? A lot of physicians might give antibiotic and maybe a course of tablets of steroid. And we might do the same thing uh, when somebody has asthma coming with the attack of bronchitis, but if that person is diagnosed with the asthma and if that person is already on medication for asthma, then there is a very good chance that that person will not come down with seasonal bronchitis. So that person doesn't have to come and see me okay. when the season change. He can just take his inhaler and stay home. Good to know. Connie had this question for us. Um, outcome of, and I'm trying to read this here, BLEBS. Do you know what that would be? Can you elaborate? Is it fatal and operate? Do you know what that would be? Blebs. See, oh, blebs. Okay. Blebs. Yeah. The the blebs is. Uh, you know, we talked about the emphysema. Dr. Patel e elaborated on that. What the blebs are? Nothing else but the finding of emphysema into the CAT scan, occasionally on the chest X as well. Basically, what the emphysema. You know, if you look at the structure. We have small alveoli, uh, small balloons in our body. And those balloons, when they get all broken down, uh, as a result of emphysema, they can become a big balloon. And that's what's called blebs. Now, the question was, is it fatal? Yeah, is it fatal? Can you operate? So the blebs, you know, depending on how big they are, um, and most of the times blebs would be just a finding that uh, we see in the emphysema. They are not fatal by itself. I mean, could emphysema be fatal? Yes, they can be. We have also seen sometimes one of those blebs or balloons might rupture spontaneously and can cause lung collapse or pneumothorax. Can that be fatal? Possibly. But it's easy treatable if you reach to an emergency room in time. Uh, the signs will be acute short shortness of breath and chest pain. And at that time, uh, they can put a chest to you to expand the lungs. And it may take a few days, uh, anywhere from two days to seven days or longer for lungs to expand. So um, so that's the qu answer to the question. Yeah. Can be, but can you I learned something new there. I'd never heard of blebs. So, but, and that, that gives some comfort, I'm sure, to the emphysema patient out there wondering if this is just a further complication that could be fatal when indeed you say, uh, you know, take good care to get to the emergency room right away. And yes, it can be treated. It can. And, and the blebs by itself is very, very commonly found, so you don't have to worry about it. And you don't treat that uh, prophylactically. Uh, you don't treat that just because it's there or, or do any surgery for that. Okay. Now, if, if a very unusual and very big blab, that's a different matter. All right. Nancy had this question for us. Dr. Pel Patel, maybe you want to tackle this one. Uh, explain, if you would, restrictive lung disease. Okay. 
So when we do lung capacity testing, which we call pulmonary function testing, there are usually two patterns. One is somebody who has asthma or COPD, and the other one is what we call restrictive lung pattern, means the lung is not able to expand either because there is a scarring in the lung or there is some tightness around the chest wall or there is a weakness in the chest muscles that helps you breathe. That's what it is called restrictive lung disease. So okay. it's just a pattern on the lung capacity testing. Tiffany had this question real quick, told by the ER that uh, at some point she had mold in her lungs. She was treated with um, antibiotics, um, still has some symptoms and coughing, and she still smokes, but she says she's cutting down. What other testing should be done? The molds can, I mean, obviously most commonly can cause allergic reaction. Uh, Asthma-like symptom would be the most common one. First thing she needs to do is stop smoking. Period. Uh, that's not a, that's just the cut most, down. <laughs> no, not cut down. Uh, that's the most important thing. Um, and the, the symptoms should go away. The, the, the other problem with the molds, occasionally, if you don't have good immunity, it can actually cause infection. And that's uh, quite a serious disease if you have mold-induced pneumonia just the, other than the asthma. All right. Well, we've got many more questions that we could ask you tonight, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. I'm sure Methodist Medical Center will be taking a look at this stack of papers that I have in my hand and making those uh, answers available on their website. In the meantime, thanks to our experts for being with us tonight. Thanks to our sponsor, Methodist Medical Center, and you, our viewers at home, for watching. We'll see you back here in a couple of weeks. Good night.